and could like play ordinary people and sing. Oh, really? Okay. And then I was like, I quit. And then like, I'm <laughs> enough. Like I can, now I can go to Guitar Center and like hit Play some ordinary people. <laughs> yeah. Bring me back well, I'm Adam, by the way. And our podcast is all about you, your journey in music. And I'd love to chat with you about your new record. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, of course. Um, I did read from Houston. Is that where you were born and raised? So I was born in Long Island um, oh. in Deer Park, and we moved, oh gosh, like 15 times, something like that. Oh my gosh. Okay. So but born I, in Long Island. How, how long were you there in Long Island? Uh, but I can't speak. I always how long say I was like, Long Island. <laughs> yeah, how Long Island? I always say I was like born into a U Haul because we moved, I think I was under a year before oh, wow. we left. Okay. Um, and we bounced around. Where did we go? I don't know. Everywhere. Um, but the biggest kind of uh, steadies were Northern California, okay. uh, like Bay Area, and in Houston, where that's where I was from, like middle school, high school, um, and then my whole family is still there. So wow. Okay. Were you in uh, Northern California prior to moving to Houston? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. I'm from Southern California. I just moved to actually new, moved to Nashville though. Uh, oh, so nice. Now. Yeah, we just, my family and I, we just moved in March. Wow, um, that's, I love Nashville. I'm always, I mean, my whole, even my grandma's like, why don't you move to Nashville? I'm like, well, I have an entire life here, but. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someday. <laughs> yeah, one day or, but I do love to get out there. I think it's such a, a cool, like city town. Uh -huh. It is, we're, we're South of the city more the in the in the burbs but we love it here man it's so it's beautiful it's so green uh it's just it, it's an incredible uh place we 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 really like it um but i we love southern california as well man i grew up there so <laughs> uh, there is just one thing that oh, is dude. although like i mean i've been out here for like oh my gosh 12 years wow and I'm like tired of it. I'm like, son, again. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's funny that you say that because the heat here and the weather here is so much more. It's so much different. I mean, we got here. We moved right like the week after everything was like frozen. And, you know, Texas was frozen where the windmills weren't moving around oh, and everything. I went to Texas. The one trip that I took during the pandemic was I flew to Houston the day before that. <laughs> We woke up the next morning, no power, no water, busted pipes, like oh. the dog is like shivering, going out in the snow. It was honestly, I was kind of, I kept telling my parents, like, I'm kind of happy that I'm here, actually. Like, this is a fun, we'll never forget this. Sure. Like, in the yeah. middle of a pandemic, the one time that I like venture out of my house, I barely left my house, like literally the whole freaking year. Uh -huh. And I would go with my N95, my shield, my gloves. I bought the seat next to me. I'm like, okay, like, let's go. <laughs> and then we land for like, t sorry to interrupt, but that. No, no, this, that's fast. Oh, wow. I mean, wow. What a, what an experience. It was wild. Oh my gosh. But yeah, we moved like right like the week after that. And my mother-in-law and everyone is like, are you sure you want to go right now? Like you can always wait. And we're like, ah, we're just going to do it. Ended up being like beautiful. We got really lucky. But after being here for like a week or so, there was tornadoes and all this stuff. My kids are like freaking out. But yeah, anyway, we love it here. <laughs> Besides the weather. It's nice. I'll have to hit you up next time I'm, uh, I'm out there. I would love that. That'd be so cool. Um, so you I did read you went to Berkeley School of Music. So you obviously are very and your records are amazing. You're super talented. But I would love to hear how you got into music. Yeah, so music for me was kind of like I always say I showed up a little late to the party just in the context of like so many other creative people I know that like you know we're like two years old playing like Beethoven or something right, yeah. um, <laughs> and so for me like I took piano lessons when I was a little kid because my mom was like take piano lessons and I hated it and I would cry and I would like leave my shoes at home and stuff like that so I wouldn't have my to go. Shoes at home. That was a big one for me. I did it at first at, for school too. I would be like, That's "Sorry, soft. I can't actually go inside." And she's like, "What are you talking about?" I'm like, 
don't have my shoes. <laughs> That's solid. I'm I'm not telling my kids. That. I mean, I have a five year old. No, that would be like perfect for him. Genius. That really uh, is. <laughs> oh man. Uh, so I quit. I just didn't really like it, and I guess the theme of that, in hindsight, was I just actually didn't like to be taught things in a in a kind of professional feeling, sterile feeling, learning place, uh -huh. um, which still to this day has has been true. Um, <laughs> but when I was like fifteen, I maybe fifteen and a half, because I remember I had my my driver's permit. And I went to Borders Books in Houston, Texas on Westheimer next to Shipley's Donuts with one of my best friends and her mom was, was in the passenger seat because I had my permit. And I bought this album by an artist called Aqualung. Um, and the album's called Strange and Beautiful. And I put it on in the car in the parking lot and was just like, wow. Oh my gosh, what just happened? I can still see you. Sorry. So. It started. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I put the CD in. Uh, wow, CD. And I was just like, this is what I want to do. And it's kind of like that, that kind of cliche moment that I feel like also a lot of especially writers and, and stuff have where it's like, oh, I want to make this and and I've since gotten to work with him and, and become friends with with this guy his name is Matt Hales and I, like I was sobbing the first time he opened his front door and I was standing there I was like wow and he's like mm. and I'm like I'm you have no idea like you changed my whole life you changed the course of my whole life whether or not you intended to like just by you doing what you do you literally changed the course of my life and he describes his music as sad underwater music um which you know in my that's kind of become like my kind of comfort zone is just like mid tempo unrequited love vibes um mm -hmm. but that's what really got me into to music again um and i started playing piano again i started taking lessons started playing in church okay. um which is also kind of a cliche thing i feel like a lot of musicians did yeah. Um, yeah, kind of get there. I mean, that's really a spot where you can perform really young. I mean, and totally. Playing to, and playing like people regularly, too. you're playing yeah. weekly and you have rehearsals and you're learning about harmonies. And mm -hmm. and so that was really cool. And I had a piano teacher that I, I still am friends with today um, called Diane from from a church that we were going to. And um, she's so sweet. And, and I basically Anytime I went to learn something, I would learn enough to be able to do what I wanted to do and then quit. So piano, I learned enough to be like, okay, I know like a few chords and a few different keys. I'm done. I can write a song now. Mm -hmm. And I would start writing songs. And then oh, wow. that kind of progressed through. I would take, I took jazz piano lessons then with this guy called Gary Norian in Houston. He was like the dude in Houston, like playing at all the clubs and like, making all the arrangements for all these singers and all this stuff. And he was so brilliant. Um, and I went and would take lessons with him until I like could, could solo in the key of C <laughs> and could like play ordinary people and sing. Oh, really? Okay. And then I was like, I quit. And then like, I'm <laughs> enough. Like I can, now I can go to guitar center and like hit play ordinary people. <laughs> And it's really funny because still to this day, I've had a few songs actually come out with those chords in it because it's like the only, anytime anyone wants to do something like a little R&B or like kind of jazzy, I'm like, I have the chords <laughs> and I'll play these chords. And like, I've had a couple songs come out with like, where I'm like, that is so funny because those are my like, I call them like Go my to. guitar center chords where it's like, like, ooh, let me check out this organ. <laughs> and it's just like, all these complicated jazz chords, I have no idea what they are. Um, and then I, that kind of just started with, you know, playing in church, jazz piano. I started taking jazz vocal lessons with a woman called Kelly Gray, who was incredible. Um, I did show choir, I did musical theater. I did, you know, the medieval, the Renaissance festival madrigal group. I did like Houston boy choir, I did anything to kind of almost by process of elimination, especially in hindsight, I can see that of like, maybe I'll do this. No, maybe I'll do, no, maybe I'll do, no. And the one thing that stuck with me was 
how magical it was to write a song mm -hmm. um, that you could sit down and something would just come out of your face and it would be a song that just blow and it's still to this day so long as i'm not in my like bitter jaded hole that i've dug myself over all these years when i'm like on above ground i'm like wow this is still to this day the coolest part of this whole thing is that you can go in a room now i rely so heavily on collaboration um but the fact that you can go in a room with strangers and stuff flies out of your faces that you don't know where it comes from. You don't know what it means. You're all chasing something. You all have different worlds that you're pulling from. And then you can leave with even a really shitty song. It's still to me like that's a song, though. And we yeah. wrote that. <laughs> it's something that's never been created before. And you just made it within however, you know, that's bizarre to think, too. I never thought of it out that way. It's really, I have tried to, to hold on to that. Um, Cause that really is just, I mean, it's wild. Every single time it's wild. Even to sit down and come up with an idea or a melody. It's like, where did that, I mean, sometimes you're like, oh, I just heard that song on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> but if it's not that, then it's like, oh my gosh, like something just flew out of my head. And, and, you know, I don't really take. I'm, I don't really take credit and I don't, even when you see it happen in the room, it's like, I love you. You're amazing. But that came from somewhere else. Like, the, <laughs> like you're, I, it really does feel like that weird mystical vessel kind of thing that people talk about. Is for it me, like, some, like an imposter type syndrome or not really? So just that, how did, where did it come yeah. from? Yeah, I think definitely I can get down with an imposter syndrome. I have a wonderful therapist um, that helps me, but um, <laughs> And I tend to tattoo stuff on my body almost to like negate the feeling of that. Like, <laughs> that's I'm surprised cool. I have a bunch of tattoos have... too. <laughs> nice. I have a lot that have to do with, with music and things that I've been able to do and almost like reminders of like, no, like you did that cool thing. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you were there. Right. Um, but yeah, and that, and that kind of started my thing. And then I applied to go to Berkeley a year early, actually, out of high school. I said no. Uh, I said okay. Um, oh, really? So the first time, but I mean, to be able to go from fifteen having your permit to being like, okay, I'm gonna go back and play piano, like using what I've retained as a kid, and then even getting in. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Thank you, thank you. And it was, it was. Re I I still remember those. There was a girl called Paris that that came to Houston. I think on the audition rounds and stuff, and. Um, and then I, she gave me like the tour of the campus and stuff, and that was really so sweet. Um, but then I went after high school, I went to Berkeley and I went for a semester and I am still to this day, technically on a, an extended leave of absence, <laughs> <laughs> um, which I don't know if I like subconsciously was like, let me just have that fall back. <laughs> like, sure. <laughs> like in a couple of slow years, I'll be like, I'm going back to school. Um, <laughs> but, and that kind of started the, my brother had lived in LA um, at that time. And I got in touch with a woman called Eve Nelson that really was like my first mentor. Um, and she had been to Berkeley and I talked with her on the phone one night and sent her like my MySpace. And she was like, babe, move to LA. Like, I did Berkeley. It's amazing. You'll learn so much. But if it, you know, it, just from what you're saying, it sounds like you just want to do it. And she was like, move out here. So I told my parents, I'm going to transfer to Musicians Institute on, on Hollywood Boulevard. I didn't even know if that was a real place. <laughs> I'm going to the music school of LA. Yeah, I'm going to LAMS. <laughs> the music school and it's a really big deal and i got a full ride <laughs> it won't cost you a thing <laughs> <laughs> um but i will need to borrow some money um yeah. just pay for the room and board and we'll be good <laughs> right so that kind of that got me out here um i crashed on my brother's floor for like two or three years on a blow-up wow. mattress and um and then with eve she got me my first like she's really responsible for so much in my life and kind of just setting trajectories and and also 
showing me like that I could do it, you know, like it, it's you move out here. You don't know. I didn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. And I'm going around to every ASCAP event, BMI event, any event that, and now it's really funny because like 12 years later, you, I wouldn't be caught dead at anywhere. <laughs> I'm like, no, I can't deal with any industry. Everyone leave me alone. <laughs> like I'm not there. I have a dog now and he is my baby and leave me alone. <laughs> um, but yeah, priorities. Yeah. Hi. He's eating, which is nice. Um, but yeah, and she she called me one night and she's like, can you come over and help me write this song for um, this game show called Minute to Win It? And I was like, that's not really what I want to do. <laughs> she's like, please just, I, I, I swear, like, just come over. And I was leaving town the next day to fly to Houston, I think. So I go over there, we write this song, we record it. And at this time I had, you know, no money. I'm living on my brother's floor. Mm -hmm. That song ended up being the theme song for this game show with Guy Fieri. Moved me into my first apartment, like, you know, paid for the next six months of my life or whatever. And really like, again, it's so interesting thinking about things in hindsight. Like that was like the key that unlocked so much, you know, it, it allowed me to have the, this freedom. And a big lesson I learned from that was like, to do uh, often, like if I go back to Berkeley and talk to students or something, I always say, always write another song. Mm -hmm. And I always say, do anything that's at all related to what you want to do. Like, don't be precious with like, oh, but I'm an artist and I will only do my art. It's like, yo, if they're hitting you up to write a Guy Fieri game show theme song, do it because everything is gonna lead somewhere and it's still related you're still creating you have a brief it's a new exercise maybe you'll come back to that later in in life you know like um but that was really what kind of and then from there i met with a publishing company i got my first publishing deal and wow you know, so that was kind of like the stepping stone for you once you had that kind of to your resume you were able to, to what, shop yourself around a bit? Or like, how did you get the publishing deal? I probably would say it didn't help on the resume, but it allowed me the freedom to, you know, not to, to at did least for a, for a brief period. Yeah, you had a little nest egg to- Even just, just be of, financially like, yeah. okay, I can pay for gas. I can pay for this shitty apartment on Hollywood <laughs> Boulevard. <laughs> That it was a dark dungeon that I lived in for eight long years. Um, <laughs> rent control is a wonderful thing. Um, oh, that is fantastic. But then, yeah, I started, I started kind of from, I met people from MySpace at the time. I met mm -hmm. people from these expos and these events and stuff. And I, I had met a writer that I started working with a bunch and he was published and I was singing a lot of demos. Um, that we wrote. And so the, his publisher had reached out and was like, oh, we'd love to, you know, meet with you. We, we love what you guys are making and yada, yada. So I went and met with them. Um, and that kind of started the, I guess, professional journey of, I signed to them as a publishing client and a management client. Um, Cause I, artistry was definitely like the thing that's always been right in, on the inside of right here on my forehead mm -hmm. <laughs> is like, you know, I want to, I want to make my own stuff. I want to release it. I want to go on tour. I want to do all the stuff. And so, um, that kind of started that journey and, and having management. And then that led to my first record deal, um, with Island Def Jam and, um, wow, that must've been big. I mean, was that tell me how that like moment was like, yeah. So that happened. I don't know if I've ever actually told like the candid story, but it's really funny and I have no shame anymore. Um, they had this, they were having a meeting with like all these, you know, high ups at Island Def Jam. Um, and they said, they basically like staged a natural event where like, they're like, be in the back studio writing a song. And then when they're here, we'll go to the back studio and introduce you. And then maybe we'll be like, oh, why don't you like, you know, play, play us some songs. So that's what we did. And I played a, a few songs on a Wurlitzer. Um, 
one of those songs was a song called 10 feet tall. Um, and they, there was one, um, woman there that became such a champion for me and, and really, uh, again, another one of those just beams of light that changes your life and, and the trajectory of everything. And, and, uh, her name is Karen Kwok and she was like freaking out. Like I was playing and she's going like, oh my God, like out loud, like, <laughs> like sounds like clapping, cheering, tearing up. And I was like, I, I kept the sweater. It's in a storage box somewhere in one of my closets. And I remember calling my mom that night and being like, I think I just, I think I just did, you know, the thing like where you meet the president of whatever and, uh -huh. and you play them a song and they freak out and everything's going to be fine. Wow. Um, and that's what happened. I mean, within, I'd say within two months, we closed the deal with Island Def Jam and within probably two or three months after that, 10 feet tall was like coming out and going on the radio with a DJ called Afrojack and like- Massive smash, massive song. I mean, it was in a commercial, right? I mean, you got- It premiered on at the commercial. Super Bowl in a Bud Light commercial, which like, was just- Unreal. Wild. What was your mom's reaction when you called her? I'm sure she was beyond. She was freaking static. out. They, they've been so, I always say that they're bigger fans of me than I am of myself. They've always been so supportive and so encouraging and so, um, yeah, just supportive with like, like all advocates that. for your, yeah, obviously, it, yeah. I think it's kind of rare. Like even, you know, I, mm -hmm. the school I went to in Houston was like, you know, like George W. Bush went there. Like, it's like a, wow. this, like you go to college, you get a big job, you're the president of a company, you go to Harvard or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was like, eh, I'm going to just make songs <laughs> up out of, out of thin air. Like, and even some of my friends, parents and stuff were like, so what are you doing? <laughs> and I, was like, I think I'm just making a really big bet <laughs> and I'm going to hope that it pays off. And so that was a really cool moment of like, oh shit. Like, I did, I did something like this is working out. Yeah. Um, well, real quick on the, on the story of Island Def Jam, was that your management that set up that idea of you being in the back? Like, yeah. okay, that's so brilliant. Yeah, it was pretty, okay. it was pretty good. Cause it, you know, you don't, they didn't want it to feel like an audition or something. Right, right. So having it feel like, oh, you just happen to be here. Oh, what? Oh, there's a piano in right there. Oh my god! Like what? A... No, that's time, such like, a brilliant my idea. I'm also like peeing in my pants. Right, of course, of course. I mean, you didn't know how that how that could have went. It could have been like, right. oh yeah, this dude's just playing. Okay, cool. Like, right. Let's, let's carry on. <laughs> like picking up the phone. Right, but instead, it just it changed your life. Yeah, and that was uh, that was the first of of a handful of, of things. Um, from there, you know, we, my whole demeanor changes from there. Island Def Jam split. Oh yeah. Okay. And, and it was around that time when you signed to them. It was like probably six months after I signed, they split and it was kind of really shaky. Um, I went with Karen to Island. Um, I met a, a really incredible man called David Massey, um, who took me on and we, you know, we, like, especially in the context of like, when we are having this conversation, as I'm like getting ready to put my first record out, like we just mastered it. Like, I know it's coming out, uh -huh. <laughs> um, you know, I was working on a record then that was called, these words are all for you. And I went to London for three and a half months and made it. And I went to France and I went, you know, worked with all these people I dreamed of working with. And, and then when 10 feet tall started picking up, it kind of, we had to fast track something. And so we scrapped the record, we put out an EP mm -hmm. and that was an incredible problem to have. Like, um, oh yeah. Like we're chasing like, you know, a top 20, pop radio song like let's oh, go sure. so we put out this ep and you know i think it's always hard when you sign to you know this group and then now it's this group and then now you're over here there's you know things can just get a little confusing um yeah 
So we ended up after the EP, we ended up transitioning out of Island um, and going independent for which I was not excited about at the time. I thought I felt just crippled and just like, you know, I had just seen what a label can do. Like my first song ever to come out in the world debuted on the Super Bowl. <laughs> and to go from that to be like, well, independent. What do you mean we're independent? <laughs> it yeah. sounds like you're just telling me that we're alone. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, and so that was really hard for me that first time. Um, and I, oh my God. And I was in rehab when we did that. So I was getting sober for the second time. I got sober the first time when I was 20. Mm -hmm. I got sober the next time, I guess, 26. Congratulations. Um, thank I just, you. I just got four years. Uh, oh my this, gosh, amazing. Like a week ago or 17th. So whenever Congrats. That thank you. That's amazing. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good life. It's not it really always, is. It's not always the easiest thing in the world, but it's a good life. <laughs> That's a good you get to be here for it all. Right, right. You'll remember it all. <laughs> yeah, for better or for worse. <laughs> um, and so I remember my my managers. Um, I was with a new management company then, um, who I'm still with now. A company called Vector that are just like um, I wouldn't. I I would have I would have quit without them. Like they've just been the best. They're such good people. They care so much, and they're such hard workers. But they came to my treatment center and they were like, you just, we just wanted to, you know, tell you in a safe space. So this is my, my therapist and then my two managers and me. <laughs> they brought a team. <laughs> yeah. And, and they're like, we're, we're, we're leaving Island and, and we're going to be independent. It's all going to be okay. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to stay here for another month. Um, so sign, tell whoever you need to tell that because I'm not ready. I was meant to leave like the next week. And I was like, hold on guys. <laughs> yeah. They try to get you out of there pretty quickly, don't they? Yeah, it was like I did 30 days and then I stayed another 30 and, and okay. you know, kind of learning that threw me for a bit of a loop because I had these thoughts of, you know, when I get out, we can finish this record and we can do this and we can do that. And then learning this is kind of like, oh my God, like, holy shit. And so I stayed another month and then I left and, and, and you know, slowly got my footing back and, and slowly started creating again. And, you know, there is that weird thing of like, can you make stuff when you're sober and like, is it good? And it turns out actually everything I made when I was using was like actually awful. I just thought it was really good. <laughs> um, it's an interesting I, way, right? You're like, I, oh, actually, this wasn't as cool as I thought. It was. No, and I, <laughs> one of my best friends in the world and I, we got sober around the same time. We used to write together all the time. And it was so funny to go and listen back when it felt like, you know, it was kind of safe to do so we would write the same song like three times in one week. And I was like, this is either like a brilliant exercise in like nailing a concept or we were just smashed and had no idea what we were doing and we're writing garbage all the time. <laughs> like, yeah, you're like, dude, I got a great idea. <laughs> it's like, right, it's like, it sounds a little familiar, but I don't know where it's from. It's like, it was I don't know where I heard this before. <laughs> we wrote it yesterday and the day before and last Thursday. Um, <laughs> And once I got my footing back, um, I had prior to going to rehab, I had, I had reached out in kind of the worst way to my first boyfriend. That was kind of the one that I had written this whole record about and, and all that. And, and we kind of reconnected a little bit, not in the best way. And it was confusing and, you know, kind of just how those things are. It's like, after a couple of years, you probably should just leave it. Mm -hmm. um especially when you're you know nursing a bottle of tequila like in your right. fucking car on the side of the road so i ended up finding out that he lived really close to me he lived 11 blocks away and i met this person called alex hope who is one of my best friends to this day and went over to their house and we wrote this song the first day we met on twitter I messaged Alex on Twitter when um, some Troy Sivan stuff that they worked on had come out. And I was okay. like, You're incredible. So you knew who he was through prior work. I was going to ask how that. Yeah. Happened. So I had heard um, Troy Sivan Wild. Okay. 
Um, and I, so I reached out and, and, um, Alex was moving from Australia. So when I got here, I, we got a day in and the first day we met, we wrote a song called 11 blocks. Wow. Um, and I'll never forget that day either. It was just such a nice flow of, of ideas. And, um, I'm always so fumingly jealous that they wrote the entire chorus melody just sitting there so timidly playing the piano going my mind won't stop it's just and i was like who are you and how did we just meet and can we please will you be my best friend <laughs> um and i would say i think it was the night that like we wrote it during the day i sent it to my managers and was kind of like i think I think something is really good here. I've never really heard a song like this. It came from such a natural, you know, honest place. Something feels special about this. What do you guys think? And my manager, my the, the head of the management company, one of the one of the um, partners of it, um, Jack Rovner, sent the song to L.A. Reid that night. After he heard it, he heard it like one time. He's like, "This is incredible." Uh, like, and he didn't tell me, and like. The next day or within three i have no concept of time but it was all within a week of writing okay. this song. he says ellie reed wants to sign you and wants to put this song out and he wants to meet you and you know go over to the office and so i'm like oh, what the fuck? so i go over there and play the song i'm crying everybody's in this room i'm crying because like this i the song means like i'm like this is really honest and i'm crying because like holy shit, like I'm sitting here in this room with Epic Records, the whole staff is in here like cheering and freaking out. People are crying. Wow. And I think within a month, maybe two months of writing the song, it was on the radio and I was signed to Epic Records. And like within three months of signing, I'm on tour opening for Andy Grammer and Gavin DeGraw and I'm just Whoa. like floored um and again one of those things that just like changes your whole life and then again it was we had put out this song it's doing incredible it got up to number 11 which i thought was really funny um on hot e <laughs> radio and that's cool and it and it's and it stopped and there you know, when, when now that I'm independent again and in a really beautiful way and, and I'm, I'm stoked on it, it's so interesting to look back on this stuff and realize like when you're on a major label and I don't hate major labels, I, I love them. They're, they can be amazing. Um, and there's, there's some wonderful, wonderful people uh, out there on the business side. There is also some really terrible people. Um, but I, I haven't, you know, I've had some really good experiences and, and, but it's like when something goes like number 11, it should be this monumental moment. And it kind of just, I guess the politics of everything and the bigness of everything makes it seem like, oh, that that's not really a win. Cause it right. didn't go Cause it wasn't number 10. one. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't top oh, five. Or, one. It didn't cross right. over to top 40 radio or it didn't. And that's really whether that's on, whether that's my own you know understanding of everything or whether that was really kind of put on it and put on me i don't even really know like nobody told me like that was a failure like whatever but it's just this vibe of like oh it's just okay so it's just so that's you guys that's over like <laughs> it's yeah. like and then are they like, what, what, what's the next one? Are you going to be able to follow that up with the next so one? So then it became the... that. And then L.A. Reid left Epic, which felt really similar to Island Death. Island. Island. Yeah. And so it's kind of, and I, and I got to work with Joey Arbage, who is awesome. And again, another like huge cheerleader, such a passionate guy. And, but at the same time, when something is signed by one person and given to another person, I do think and this is not at all shady like it is a weird thing it's kind of like if somebody gave you something that's really special to them it might not be so special to you or you might right. have to try to understand okay well 
what what are we doing here or like and what and whatever and, and I also think even when I look back like I didn't know what I what I wanted to do uh-huh. so how uh, then how hard is it to be like you know to express like well, I don't really I need a little I don't know like help <laughs> Yeah, well, it's kind of, I've heard that story before where it's kind of like uh, bands will get lost in the shuffle when it comes to an a r guy leaving to another label. Then it's the people that are adopting you or adopting the, the record are like, well, this literally isn't mine. Like, I didn't find this. Yeah. And then they yeah. don't want to really push it, I would think, not as right. hard as they would if they found found you or right. signed you. Right. And I, and I will say, like, both with Dave Massey and with Joey, they really... <laughs> They really took, um, <laughs> they really took me on as like, you know, I, I, I felt so much support and so much like, um, excitement still. And, mm-hmm. but it, but it just did become like, okay, well, what's next? What's the next song? And, and even with that, like, I, we all had different ideas of what that would be. Um, and, and I had been working on an album again. <laughs> And we had a song that was peaking at number 11 and we put out an EP to follow it up because I'm on tour and I, we need to have songs out there that people can learn and people can sing and people can, you know, get into. And that time it hit a little bit, a little bit more. The first time it was just so exciting. The second time I was like, dang, like, you know, I, I really want to put out an album. I've always wanted to put out an album. Um, long story short, we transitioned out of Epic. Mm-hmm. And that time was a little different because i think i i felt like i had a little more groundings i was sober for you know i kind of felt a little bit more in myself um i had come out into the island deal so i had a little more comfort with that and with my own self and my own identity in my own body sure that Um, was difficult to to you know that, that was setting like a professional setting i, I don't know I, it was a weird it was hard for me and and i i remember so vividly when sam smith made their first statement mm-hmm. where i was on an airplane with one of my managers nikki and i was like it felt like a sigh of relief like i was like sam smith is on top of the world mm-hmm. and sam smith just came out and it was around, you know, like anyone that in the public eye, there's always rumors and there's this and there's, you know, whatever. And I think that's really shitty, but like such a beautiful statement, such a, you know, truthful, you know, thing. And, and that really, that was awesome. And, and that's something I've carried for a while, even with, you know, any sort of advocacy that I do, like. The people that have really inspired me did so by just being themselves Mm -hmm. where they're at, you know, and, and that I think is really powerful. Um, so yeah, it was, it was definitely weird. And I, I remember like the first time I put a, a male pronoun in a, in a song or said, you know, whatever, and feeling like, can I do that? And, and, um, all that, but, but again, I do feel really lucky to have, had my managers around me that were also supportive and the the labels that were like didn't bat an eye They're like okay mm-hmm. cool like, like yeah whatever, like, whatever. <laughs> yeah, everybody's also like well duh <laughs> and i'm like dang really <laughs> oh. um but so then yeah we went independent um after epic and and that really started this flow and i give so much credit to my managers that started this flow of music coming out and just it became so exciting and inspiring to be able to write a song that I love and release it like three weeks later without all these hoops and all the, like, what's the rollout plan and what's this and what's that? My best friend Yaz does all my visuals. I'd hit up Yaz, be like, come over, take a picture in my bedroom. Like most of the covers are in my bedroom because I have this great little window that just gets this beautiful sunlight. We tape a piece of like fucking poster board behind me <laughs> and she's taking like the most beautiful pictures that feel like me for the first time in my whole life i'm like how did you do this and and it started this process of me being like oh independent can be great because you can do what you want as cliche as it sounds you can do what you want with the people you want mm-hmm. how you want you can release what you want 
you can, you know, I'm, I feel so lucky to have dear friends that are like incredible producers that will work with me on stuff and, you know, not really candidly, you know, do deals that are really nice and, and, and as a partnership and it, and it does form this little, this little kind of team, I think even more mm -hmm. because there's not a ton of money flying around and there's not the politics going around and there's not all this stuff and smoke and mirrors and big, you know, I, I joked with now I'm, I partnered with network, um, what is it? Indie label, um, on this record. And I was joking, like, you know, I don't really ever want to play on the rooftop of a building ever again, because I was presented by, you know, all these big labels and these big flashy things. And I'm wearing some fancy stuff. And I was like, I actually don't want to do that anymore, because I'd rather just keep it all low key, mm -hmm. make, make the songs the best fucking songs I've ever written, I've ever released, make the production sound just like me, make the visuals look just like me and just keep it, let's just do it all. And then pandemic, it really, I feel so, you know, it was the first two months I didn't do really anything, but it allowed this really nice time where nothing else is going on. Mm -hmm. Once you, you know, once I got yeah. through, <laughs> sure and realizing I, that everyone, we're gonna be okay right. hopefully here yeah and i didn't leave the house and then and it really did allow this kind of bizarre eerie time and space to go in on this record i met network on zoom like wow and and that was the first time i've ever had a really candid conversation with you know, a label or anything like that. And, and again, it's still independent. It's big gay records, which is my label, um, through network and just being able to talk to someone and they're so nice and they're so passionate and, and they're under, they understand, you know, like to kind of go through, like, these are things that have happened in the past that I will not do again. Mm -hmm. I've never done that in my whole life. I didn't think that there was room for that. You know, you can't really go into some big, huge label uh, unless you're, you know, selling a hundred million records and be like, this is what I am doing. Right, right. And so that was just so cool for that to be met with. Like, amazing. Like, we're just fans and we just want you to do you and we'll, we'll work it and we'll That's partner up on this and so we just finished this record it's still called the same thing these words are all for you which is a powerful um, statement in itself you know i mean going back to what you were just saying i was playing it for my best friend in the whole wide world and he we listened to the whole thing and at the very end he was like well that's what you should call it and i was like that's crazy because that's what the first record was called Oh, before I had come up with a new, yeah, I had come up with a new title because I'd written this song um, called Let Love In that I was like, you know, the record is, I, I always thought my first record would be a breakup album and, and it's very much not. I mean, I'm in love. I'm, I feel great. And I wanted it to reflect that. It still has, you know, the sordid past on it, but it was hopeful. And, and so I wrote this song. I, I had this idea to, to write a title track called Let Love In. Um, where it's like a bridge between the past and the present and the future of just like, I'm, I'm ready to let love in wherever, wherever love's at, that's where I want to be. And, and so it was called that for a little bit. And then um, it was called London for a little bit. Cause that's a, one of my favorite songs on there. Um, and then it's it, it, the closer has always been the same from the first record I made, you know, in 2013. Um, I just looked at the email because I needed to find the date we wrote that song. I was like, wow, 2013. Wow. Um, so yeah, it's the same. It's the same title. And, you know, the oldest songs are that old. The newest songs I wrote two months ago on my couch by myself. I, I wrote Nothing With A Love, which is the single we have out now mm -hmm. um, uh, by myself. It's the first song I've ever released that I wrote 
Just me. Really? Wow. That's pretty incredible. And that was just written a few months ago as well, you said? Yeah, like probably two, three months ago. Wow. So you've been able to work on this record throughout the course of the whole quarantine? Yeah, we did. I think I did two weeks with um, Stint, who's one of my best friends. He's executive produced the record. And we, he was so kind. I mean, I was really scared and really, I lived a very small life for, for pretty much the whole, until like, you know, two weeks ago. Now I've been to a restaurant every single night for the past two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Since it all kind of opened up. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, who wants to go to dinner? It's like, let's go. Um, <laughs> which is really fun to see so many people eating outside beautiful weather it's like sm- i'm like crying with the staff of the of restaurants like it's amazing but um he was he was so good at creating like you know we would both do a few rounds of testing and you know making sure that we didn't have any i mean i was always like i haven't seen anyone so <laughs> if he had other people over, we'd wait, you know, the allotted time and, and do testing and whatever. So that when we were in the studio, it was able to feel safe. I did the last vocals at my favorite studio out here called the village, um, where they installed like UV light filtration in the AC. Like I was like, y'all got it good. Like, thank you for making such a beautiful and special place to me and I think to so many people the creatives in LA the village is such an iconic place and and it they they went so above and beyond to make it feel safe and clean and that was incredible to actually you know you have to be able to let go and 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 sing and take your mask off and fucking you know in a room and I was like this is crazy I haven't been in a room um so that was really that was really nice and and again to get to make you know I have it's a lot of my best friends on the record that's who the songs with and Mm -hmm. and to have stint producing it like that's my it's been my dream for a few years I found emails you know tracing back five six years of me being like I really want to work with this guy stint I think he needs to produce this song called good that I wrote and now to have him doing the whole album it's like it's big it's huge really cool really cool speaking to the village i mean that's one of your one of your songs as well does it have anything to do with the no sadly studio is just totally because i know there's yeah obviously it could have been like a subconscious like word thing though because i yeah that's right i never have ever thought about that in my life that's really interesting that's yeah i was just curious because i mean that's a huge song for you yeah thank you that still to this day that is like the the song that surprises me the most every day still to this day if i open my dms i have a dm from someone from somewhere saying i just heard this song and i'm in tears i just heard this song and i sent it to my friend who just came out i just heard this song and i played it for my family so they could understand me i just heard this song and you know it's it's Uh it's this thing that just keeps going and what, yeah i was gonna say what a gift i mean every day you can open your phone and yeah. like be like you know such gratitude like oh wow like the song is still you know changing lives yeah it, re- it really 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 i mean i have goosebumps as you just said that i it's i think if there's any reason why i do what I do it's to help someone feel not like they're not alone whether it's a love song or a breakup song or whatever and it's also selfishly for me to not feel alone you know I don't think it's like this holier than thou thing of like I will show you healing it's like I'm healing too and I I try to communicate that with you know with whatever I do at shows even on on social media and whatever you know some level of non icky transparency you know like non intentionally pieced together (laughs) transparency of just like here here i am and i mean sometimes that's gotten me in not trouble but like yeah i like to think that people think people that are listening and following like think that they know me because they do 
if that makes sense. There's no, no for sure. Like, You're letting people into your your live, obviously. Yeah, and 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 the village was such a lesson in in that it was the first time I ever wrote a song that wasn't about me. I wrote it for these two kids that I these two trans kids I met, and uh-huh. that was a weird thing because I didn't know you could do that. I mean, I wrote I wrote the song for these two kids to send them, like with with no real intention of releasing the song. Wow, it was right. just hey, right. I wrote this for you. Yeah, I, I had I met them on tour and I was floored by them and just who they were and 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 how just who they were and how they were and it was just so inspiring and and I I wrote it um, the day federal protections for trans students was taken out of public schools mm-hmm. um, under the previous president and I sent it to them. And was like, I, I wrote you this song because it, it just kind of was so heavy on me, you know, hearing because I was talking to one of them hearing like what it was like. And he was like, I just left school early because everyone's being m- mean. Awful. Like, yeah, yeah. And it just kind of was like, how, how, in what world is it a good idea to like, not protect a a like Human group being. of people already yeah. yeah that's already like like so looked down upon and so targeted and and mm-hmm. it like and kids in this in school like it just blew my mind and so hearing what it was actually like for for them um and then they wrote back that night like dude you have to put this out and i said okay dude <laughs> and so <laughs> so we we did and and it really just has been such a beautiful thing to see and i i have that's maybe the biggest song that i've put out that i that i have that thing of like i don't know where that came from you know like Mm -hmm. when someone even when someone's like thank you so much for that song whatever i'm like thank you for the song like i don't know what i don't know if i that i did that if that makes sense Mm -hmm. like it was it feels very much like it's floating around well, um, you wrote it for someone else instead of yourself. Maybe it has something to do with yeah, that. Yeah, that's really true. I never thought thought of it in that in that way. But yeah, that's been a really, like, you know, I mean, I was going to say that's like been the coolest thing that I've ever done because it kind of, it, it kind of is. It's just the most special thing. It's so outside of, I try to live pretty outside of like the industry and even as a writer, like I'm not, I don't view myself as like a competitive pop songwriter. Mm-hmm. Um, and for a long time, that really pissed me off. And it made me feel like shit because I'm like, why can't I write the song that, you know, is really cool and really fresh and everyone's singing along and it's simple enough to where a four year old can sing it, but it has enough emotion for, you know, a 50 and up to like really latch on, like whatever. Yeah. All, and it's less than three and a half minutes long and it's at least 102 <laughs> BPM. All right. There's so much stuff that's put on to, to you as a songwriter by publishers, by managers, by A&Rs, even I'm speaking even as a writer for others. Um, and that song has been such a cool, there's been a few things that I've put out that were so outside of that then turned into something really special mm-hmm. that I'm like, oh, so I really don't have to like try to do that thing that I don't even feel like I'm good at. And that I, every time I try to do it, it doesn't work. And the only time that something even ends up in that world was by a complete accident, <laughs> by making stuff with people that I love, sometimes as a half joke and you make something and now it's a pop song and now it's on the radio. Mm-hmm. It, but it's definitely not like I don't view that as my forte. I love, I love the hot AC format. I love artists that write songs. I love write. If I'm working with an artist, I love to, for better or for worse, I love to write the artist's favorite song. Mm-hmm. I love to tell the story that they've never told. And sometimes it's literally ends up being. I got one where they were like, "It's actually too personal. And I can't put it out." <laughs> and I'm like, okay. "Really." Honestly, still one of my favorites still to this day, like it's all good. Like I understand, but I much more gravitate towards that than like, you know, I've, I've worked with writers before where they're like, 
well, this artist A and R said they need this. So when we get once they get here, let's try to do that. And I'm like, but that's so shitty. Like, why don't we just let the artist say what the artist wants to say? Sure, A and R can deal with it because they find <laughs> the artist. And maybe that's because I've been that artist. It's like no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, no, I for sure. For I mean, yeah, I. <laughs> it's interesting how that all kind of unfolds. It's weird, but yeah. Well, I appreciate you so much for for doing this, and you have your tour coming up. Uh, just the piano, which is super exciting, finally able to to play out. And yeah, I'm I'm really excited. It's a it's a small little tour right now. Um, we may have something more extensive in the new year, but I'm so excited. I can't wait to see people and to be inside of a room. Right, right. <laughs> and to be playing the new songs and, and it all kind of ends uh, September 23rd at the Regent here in LA, which is the at midnight that night, the that debut album out. is out. Yeah, and so big. That's my birthday. I, I mean, I appreciate you doing that. Oh my God, happy birthday. <laughs> I planned it. I planned it that way. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> I did. I did. That's so cool. Well, I love what you're doing. I can't wait to hear the whole record. And thank you so much, Stephen, for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for the time. Yeah, I do have one more I'm question. Sorry I talk too much. I talk so no, much. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's what I. This is what this is about. It's all about you. All right. me. Um, I want to. I want to know one more uh, answer. If you could give it to me on, how, if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Advice for aspiring artists. My advice probably changes every day. My biggest thing that I've like, I don't know if someone said it to me or if I came up with it, I'd like to think I came up with it is always write another song. When you feel like you're staring at a brick wall and no one cares about anything you're doing. If you write another song, you're always planting a seed for something. You're always leaving room for something. Um, and I am an artist that like doesn't know how to write anything. That's not the truth. So my advice just through that lens it doesn't apply if you're like you know a pop star that you know theatrical performer character whole bit which is also incredible i don't i don't have advice for that because i have no idea that scares me so much and i don't know how to do it but i would say just write what is true to you write what you like if you love something that you make i bet you a lot that someone else is gonna love it and someone else is gonna connect to it. If you tell a true story, also I wanna say that a true story doesn't have to be sad. That's something that I just learned, literally, really recently. A true story does not have to be sad and a song doesn't have to be sad to connect with someone, to make someone fucking cry, to make them whatever. Um, and just, just always write another song. Even if you don't write a song for three years, Three years in a day, write a song. <laughs>